Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jeffrey. In the previous video, we discussed gene regulation with a prokaryotic black operon, right? So we talked about repressors, activators, and all of the different good stuff about the black operon. In this video, I wanted to touch on eukaryotic gene regulation. And this is done primarily through transcription factors. And I'll also give you guys some examples, such as how I did for that lac operon. Okay, so for transcription factors, these are going to be cis elements that bind to the DNA uh, directly, and specifically in the enhancer region. And you might be wondering, what are cis elements? And if there's a cis, is there a trans? So cis elements are exactly what I wrote right here. They bind to the DNA directly to induce an effect. Now, trans elements are actually going to not bind to the DNA directly, but they still affect gene regulation, they still affect transcription, right? So they're going to, uh, trans factors, trans elements are going to bind to cis elements uh, and affect how they do their job, all right? So moving on, every transcription factor has three different domains. They have a DNA binding domain, a dimerization domain, as well as an activation repression domain. So your DNA binding domain, as the name suggests, it only binds to your certain DNA sequences. It's very specific to that enhancer region um, to allow for this different type of expression of genes when you need them. Dimerization, um, essentially you need two transcription factors, the proteins to bind together, to dimerize together, to be functional, in order to be functional, okay? And then for your activation repression domain, these are going to bind your enhancer binding proteins or other transcription factors. So if we're going to take a look at this, it's going to look kind of something like that. Now, if we're saying the DNA is right here, what are going to be the domains? Well, if your DNA is here, the thing that binds to the DNA is obviously going to be the DNA binding domain. And then Right here, you can see the, the bit of a dimer right there. So you have the dimerized functional unit of the transcription factor, as well as the activation repression domain. And these are going to interact with different other factors, right? All right, so your transcription factors have two major functions. They either function as activators or repressors of genes. And for your activators, they're going to stabilize a, that basal transcriptional apparatus. And this is going to be talking about that RNA polymerase too, right? Um, for your basal transcriptional apparatus, it just means that, you know, it's going to transcribe your genes, but it's going to transcribe them at a very basal level, at a very low level. If you do add in an activator, for example, these transcriptional factors, they're going to help stabilize that RNA polymerase structure. And as a result, it's going to uh, speed up the rate of transcription. Okay? For repressors, obviously, it's going to be the opposite. And the way that it does that is through competition, quenching, and blocking. So competition is going to be, well, competition for the enhancer region, right? So if we were talking about the enhancer region from before. If we're looking at a piece of DNA, this is going to be the promoter. Uh, this is going to be a promoter. This is going to be the gene. And right here is going to be the enhancer, let's just say, okay? So if I have the enhancer region right here, I'm going to have a um, certain proteins that are going to bind to this um, this enhancer region, right? So I, I have these transcription factors that bind to it. Now for competition, essentially we have other molecules that have similar uh, DNA binding regions that compete for that same DNA slot. And as a result, that's one way that you can inhibit transcription. Now we can have quenching, and quenching is going to be quote-unquote, irreversible binding to the DNA binding domain. Now, you can think of this as if I if I quench something, then I'm going to stop it for a, bit, a pretty long time, right? If, you, if you're going to quench your thirst, um, you're probably not going to be thirsty for a long time afterwards. So what this does is that it actually binds to that DNA binding domain, 
And as a result, your transcription factor cannot actually bind to that enhancer region. Okay? And then for your blocking, what that means, I kind of try to think of it as it blocks access, right? It blocks access to the basal transcriptional apparatus to the RNA polymerase 2. And so essentially what you have in this scenario is that you have your um, transcription factor. It can bind to the enhancer region, but what happens is that you have a repressor that's going to bind to that region that we were talking about before. Now, can you remember what it was? I gave you a second right there. It is the activation repression domain, right? So it binds to the activation repression domain. And essentially, um, how these transcriptional factors work is that this enhancer region is actually further down uh, upstream, upstream of the actual gene itself, right? So essentially, this is what your DNA would actually look like. So this would be your enhancer region. Um, you would have your actual uh, promoter right here and your gene right here. And you would have your RNA polymerase right here. You may have a cofactor and you're going to have your transcriptional factor right here. So essentially your, your DNA binding domain is going to look like that. Your dimerization domain is going to look like that. And your activation uh, repression domain is going to look like that. And when you have something like blocking, you're going to block this area right here. That prevents any um, interaction with the cofactor or the RNA polymerase itself. And as a result, you're going to block uh, uh, increased transcription, right? You're only going to get basal levels of transcription. Okay, so here's an example of what we were talking about before, just that transcriptional factor that we were uh, that we were discussing. And this example is going to be HIF1, which is hypoxia-induced factor 1, right? So basically, it's going to have two, um, two repressor uh, slash enhancer domains. And what it's going to do is it's going to form a heterodimer. So your HIF1 alpha is going to be inducible or uh, it, it can actually change and then your HIF1 beta is actually going to be constitutive. So this is not going to change and it's always going to stay like that. Now, what I mean by O2 inducible is if you read this little blurb right here, essentially if you have O2 binding to these little sequences on the HIF1 alpha, which is called PBST, it degrades that HIF1 alpha. And what it does actually is that oxygen is going to um, it, it's going to provide oxygen for the hydroxylation of those residues by prolohydroxylase, right? Because you need oxygen to form hydroxyl groups. And then once you form those hydroxyl groups, it's going to be tagged by ubiquitin. And once it's tagged by ubiquitin, you might remember that you have those ubiquitin complexes and it's going to be degraded by a proteasome, right? A pro proteasome recognizes the ubiquitin and it degrades this structure. And as a result, it's not going to be functional, right? But so you might be thinking, okay, well, if I degrade it and it's not functional, then what's the purpose of it, right? Don't I need uh, a functional transcription factor to be able to transcribe genes. Now remember, I, this gene is actually, this transcription factor is called HIF1, right? It's called hypoxia-induced factor, right? So in a sense, we, we only want to activate this trans transcriptional factor if we're in a hypoxic environment. So if we actually have oxygen, then obviously we don't need to um, have this transcriptional factor, right? So here's the actual uh, blur about what it actually does if um, you have both units on and it's a working and functional transcriptional factor. It binds to your HRE, which is hypoxia uh, response element, and it induces transcription of genes required for the survival of, uh, of cells during hypoxia, right? So um, when you're in low oxygen environments, you obviously need uh, certain proteins that help you survive in those environments or else you're going to suffocate and die.
Okay, so that's just one example of a transcriptional factor. We also have glucocorticoid receptors, MCMAX, and RNAi, which is interference. Okay, so glucocorticoid receptors are going to be zinc finger transcriptional factors. So this is a little bit different from that traditional transcriptional factor that we we're talking about before, but it actually still functions in a similar way, right? So it's going to have palindromic like cis elements. So essentially, what it is is uh, this uh, if you're reading 5' prime to 3' prime on the top strand, it's going to read the same thing on the bottom strand, 5' prime to 3' prime on the bottom strand. Okay, and then there's going to be uh, some nucleotides in the middle that are going to be different, but essentially it's going to have that uh, characteristic palindromic like uh, cis elements on the sides. Okay, and then so what you do is you have cortisol outside of the cell. Remember, cortisol is a steroid compound, it's going to diffuse across the cell membrane and it's going to bind to your glucocorticoid receptor, and as a result that's going to dissociate from its regulatory element. Regulatory element obviously silences that complex so it doesn't do anything crazy and influence gene transcription when it doesn't, when it's not supposed to. And when you have two of these glucocorticoid receptors associated, they form a dimer. And when they form that dimer, it's in its active form, it's going to translocate into the nucleus and bind to that um, certain uh, elements. So before we were talking about hypoxia re response element, this one's actually going to be hormone response element. Okay, and um, it's it's going to require co-activators. So you're going to need um, certain um, co-activators here to help with that uh, that dimer to influence uh, the uh, transcriptional level of the basal transcriptional machinery. Okay, and this was just the, the same exact thing that I was talking about earlier, so I'm not going to elaborate too much on that. Mic Max, uh, so Mic is Mic and Max are um, also transcriptional factors. They have their own transcriptional binding domains. Essentially, Mic needs to dimerize, so it needs to dimerize with either um, Mic or Max, and when it's dimerized, that's when it's active and it can. Uh, do certain jobs, right? But it needs to form a dimer before it can influence any type of transcription. And if you form a homo dimer, so if if it's a mic uh, mic homo dimer, right? It's going to repress gene transcription. And if it's a mic and max hetero dimer, so if mic binds with max, it's going to activate gene expression. Right, and MIC always has a higher affinity for MAX. So if there's any MAX in the cell, it's going to form that heterodimer. Right, so uh, you can see this in cancer a lot, where the cancer cells artificially produce a lot more MAX into the cell. So as a result, you form this heterodimer. And remember, the heterodimer is needed to activate gene transcription. So you make more proteins. Right. Okay, moving on to RNA interference, there's going to be two types. There's going to be microRNA and small interfering RNA, okay? And I'm going to describe the process. I'm sorry I don't have any figures, but you're just going to have to bear with me, okay? So here's the bare minimum. You have Drosha. It's going to process your long pre-miRNAs, which are formed from your miRNA gene, right? So you have the DNA, and when it's transcribed by RNA polymerase into RNA, you're going to form this long pre-mRNA. And Drosha basically makes that into hairpin structures. So it's kind of like a pseudo um, double strand, except it's not because it's from the same strand. And exportin is going to transport it into the cytoplasm. So if you think about it in a cell, it's going to be transported by exportin here, exportin. And Dicer is going to process these hairpin structures into single-stranded RNA. Because remember, these hairpin structures look kind of like something like that, right? It has like certain kinks in it, right? So you have that hairpin right here, and then sometimes there's a, there's a kink where it forms a dimer. But anyways, it's going to initiate risk formation. Risk is your RNA-induced silencing complex. And 
when that risk formation happens, risk is going to, uh, in this case for miRNAs, it's going to imperfectly bind to your target mRNA, 3' untranslator region. Now, remember, MI, uh, mRNAs are going to have um, a 5' prime cap and a poly A tail, right? And in between that 5' prime cap and poly A tail, you're going to have that termination sequence, and then you're going to have an untranslated region right here, right? And that's going to help the RNA polymerase realize that, you know, this is the place where I need to stop uh, translating so I can make a actual protein. So risk is going to imperfectly bind to that area, and as a result, it's going to inhibit tra ribosome translation. Because as a result, your ribosome can't really uh, doesn't know where to stop, doesn't know where to uh, like, doesn't really um, like what I said, doesn't know where to stop. And as a result, you're going to have an imperfect protein. And remember, imperfect proteins get broken down by proteasomes. Okay, and then. Here we have siRNAs, which are small interfering RNAs. Essentially, it's going to be a little bit different, but it's going to use some of the same processes. So you have a double-stranded RNA. So this time it's actually going to be a real double-stranded RNA as opposed to those um, hairpin structures, right? And it's going to be turned into um, small interfering RNAs by Dicer once again. So Dicer is going to, remember, process things from double-stranded to single-stranded. So this time you're going to have double-stranded to, uh, to uh, small interfering RNA, and then this small interfering RNA is going to um, combine with that risk complex that we were talking about before, and it's going to actually perfectly bind to the three prime UTR region. And when it perfectly binds, what happens is that you're going to activate AGO2, which is actually part of that risk complex, and it's going to have use its endonuclease activity and actually break down, actually cleave that mRNA. And as a result, you won't be able to have gene transcription. Okay, so these are just some of the few different ways that eukaryotes um, actually influence their gene transcription. Remember, every single cell in your body has the exact same DNA. So you, if you're wondering why your heart is the way it is as compared to maybe your skin or your lungs, these are the reasons why. And the ma major reason is due to transcriptional factors. If you influence the expression or overexpression of certain genes, you're going to have differentiation as um as a, as a result so i hope that this video has been helpful and have a great day